morning, everyone. It's so good to see everyone here this morning. My name is Don Brzezinski. I'm the Vice President of Advancement here at Southern New Hampshire University. And I'm delighted to have with me today uh, my good colleague, Julian Alsted, uh, uh, from the, uh, uh here from our College for America program. Um, so thanks so much for coming this morning. Uh, this is a continuation of our long-held series. How many people have been to these before? Or, or so, and anyone new? We have, we have an initiation later for uh, Initiation? <laughs> no, no, it's not no hazing. That's against college rules. Uh, I'd first like to thank our, our sponsors for these events. Uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, for our Manchester version of this, is uh, Bellwether Community Credit Union. And uh, Mike Leckweir uh, is here uh, from, uh, from Bellwether. And uh, we're most grateful to have your support, uh, your long-going support for this. Uh, you'll see in your programs that the series will continue here in, in August. However, our next event, uh, for those interested, will be uh, is on June 18th uh, at the Wentworth Country Club. We're going to try something a little different and do an after-hours uh, event uh, there. Uh, and, and of course, we hope you can uh, join us for that. Uh, before we begin our program this morning, just a, just a few updates from the university. Someone was asking me earlier what's new. Uh, and I, I found that to be an unfair and loaded question uh, <laughs> uh, here at SNU. Uh, we just celebrated commencement last week. We're now, our, our commencement has gotten, it had gotten so large that we needed to move into the Verizon Center. It's now gotten so large that we need to split it into two ceremonies at the Verizon Center. Uh, if we had done it as, as one ceremony, President LeBanc would still be up there shaking hands today. Uh, this is, um, it, what's, what's really interesting is how many students from our online program are flying in from all over the place. Uh, South Carolina, Texas, you name it. Uh, so it's, yes, it's online, yes, it's virtual, and yes, they feel home here, tethered to this uh, uh, mother campus. Uh, and it's just a delightful trend to see. Uh, but with, what do we have about 45,000 of them? We're, we're gonna have multiple <laughs> uh, commencement events. Um, now it's, uh, we're on to preparing for summer orientation beginning in June and many, uh, there's a lot of renovations away. As you can see, the library uh, is actually on budget and on time, uh, nice. which is remarkable given the winter that we had, uh, truly. Uh, and um, and it's, it's just a drop dead beautiful, uh, beautiful building. Uh, our growth and investment infrastructure continues and, uh, and our online division is continuing to grow. And today we're here to talk about our latest uh, innovation, which is, uh, which is College for America. Before we get into that, one last thing is, uh, within the last few years, for those of you that are sports fans may have noticed, all of a sudden, this school has become a powerhouse uh, in, in sports. Uh, the uh, uh, the basketball, the soccer team, uh, men's soccer team, uh, won the D Division II National Championship. The softball team uh, didn't want to be upstaged, so they took on their own championship. Uh, and the men's baseball team will play in the first round of the regional tournament here on campus. Um, so. And the hockey team won. And the hockey team won. How could I? <laughs> this is why I have plants in the audience. Uh, it, it, it's been a good year. It's been a fantastic year for the athletics department. So uh, today we have an opportunity to talk about uh, with, uh, with Julian, uh, who has a, uh, a lot of established uh, and well-regarded expertise uh, in the area of workforce development uh, and the ways in which our College for America program is partnering with employers. I, I, just quick, how many people have heard of or know anything about College for America? So this is about 60% of you. Um, and uh, we wanted to uh, ask Julian just to chat a little bit about you know, what is workforce development generally uh, and uh, how this innovative program is addressing both that need and, and some of the criticisms that, that are out there on, on higher ed in terms of how ossified as an industry it's been. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's out, we've outpriced ourselves, we've, access has been a problem, and are we really addressing the economic needs of the nation? So uh, I am now going to get out of Julian's way and, and let the real expert talk. Thanks so much, Don, and, and good morning to everyone. It's really Great to, it, it's really great to, to, to be able to, to, to meet you know, folks who are actually of the community and, and have this c deep connection to SNU. Um, it's, it's, so just a little bit of background. So, so I joined SNU a year ago, March, 
um, after having some initial conversation about um, with Chris Clerken, who's, who's executive director of College for America, um, Chris and I were talking about the possibility of me coming on board to, as part of, so the leadership team to build this new college. And, and my role, and, and to take on this role of ensuring that our offerings have labor market relevance. And for the previous 15 years, I had founded and ran a consulting think tank um, that worked nationally called Workforce Strategy Center um, and that you know, was focused on how can we make education more responsive to the economy in this country. And, I, you know, and, and, and while we were involved in a lot of really important work and we had worked in 23 states and with scores of employers and colleges, you know, the truth is that in workforce development, while there are some great innovations, most of what's been done out there is little boutique stuff here and there and there. So, um, so when Chris started talking about what you know, Paul and she were trying to accomplish here. It was like, wow, and, and you know, within, and, and I certainly was not looking for a job. I loved what I was doing, but I ended up actually merging the think tank in with the university to help make this happen. So College for America um, is, is, is a, it, it's really set up to address, well, first of all, just so you understand the structure. So, of course, there's new, there's university college, there's the online college, which I would now call a traditional online college, which is um, you know the third la largest nonprofit online in the country, growing by leaps and bounds. And then there's us, and we've really been set up to solve some very specific problems. We are really about um, targeting work, targeting working adults, um, and working with employers through a B two B model to do so. And it's 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 really a college that's in, intended to address issues around access for these folks. Um, afford, you know, uh, accountability, um, really making sure that college is accountable. And I'm going to talk about all this stuff just a little bit before we, I really want to have a conversation. I don't want to lecture by any means. Just take, you know, whatever, five, ten minutes. Um, and, then, and, then, and then affordability. Um, so accountability, uh, access, accountability, and affordability. And, and, um, and just sort of, you know, it's, it's really about uh, so many of the gaps that we have, the education gaps, the skills gaps, the perception gaps. Um, the, the skills gap, you know, we hear a lot about this. Um, according to uh, Georgetown University, by 2020, 65% of the job openings in the country require some post-secondary. Um, so, and we hear, keep hearing variations of this again and again, the sort of rising skill demand. So it used to be that you could, you know, have a high school diploma or GED and get a job and have a career. And entry to the middle class is definitely now, is now post-secondary. Um, and then there's these huge perception gaps, like, well, whose issue is this to deal with? So there were two studies that came out in January and February, both done by Gallup, two polls, um, for different organizations. But one found that an overwhelming number, whatever, what is it, 96% of um, academic leaders think that um, they're doing a good job of preparing graduates for the workforce. And at the same time, only 11% of business leaders agree with that. So it's like, you know, it's like, well, who's, <laughs> who's challenge, whose problem is this? And is it, is it the problem with the colleges? Is it the problem with the businesses? And then, um, and then at the same time, we did a survey recently of, of um, four or 500 um, business leaders, College for America, that found that 71% of the employers we spoke with um, said that they want to develop employees and talent um, from within, but that the workers lack the skills they need to advance them. So College for America has really been set up to kind of hit this all head on. Um, and how are we doing it? OK, well, first of all, the, the, the big innovation is that we're competency-based. And um, so what that means is that, you know, whereas all of you, I assume, um, and all of us uh, who, who, who did attend college, um, took classes and earned credits, and those credits added up. And when we had enough credits, we graduated. And, and the time we spent in school and earning those credits was, you know, based on the, top, you know, the schedule <laughs> of the school and perhaps the, you know, the the dictates of the of the of the professor. Um, um, in College for America, we've kind of taken, we've completely divorced from from that uh, credit hour, um, and 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 and, for, and so for us, students undertake projects. Um, upon uh, embedded in these projects are competencies, and upon successful mastery of, say, their 120 competencies, they have their degree, whether it takes them three months or three years. Um, it's 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 project based. Um, the, the 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 
projects students are taking on uh, feel much more like what they do in real life and in work. Um, and it's, again, it's really designed for working adults. So, 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 so many of our students, um, the average student um, uh, profile is like 41, about 40 years old, 41 years old, more women than men um, so far, but early, the returns are fairly early. But um, these are people who are you know, hardworking, coming to work every day, solid citizen employers, um, you know, and they're trying to juggle life and uh, families and, um, and, you know, and when, it, and when it comes to going back to school, life or family, uh, you know, work and family always prevail. So, um, seem to prevail. So, so the idea of College for America is, is largely that um, it's, it's, and it's $2,500 a year. <laughs> All you can learn. It's, it's like, uh, send a huge shockwave through the higher ed world. Um, um, because what we're providing is a fully accredited degree from SNU. So when a student graduates, they get a SNU diploma just like yours. Um, and, um, and because everything we're doing maps back to that degree. So, and what we're really doing is working with companies to solve some very specific kinds of problems. Um, it, it, and, right, and I should say, we started in um, January of 2013 and sort of soft launch, we went through the summer, um, and then in October went live. We currently have, um, I believe it's 57 uh, uh, partners, corporate partners. Um, and we've had uh, 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 around 800 students touched by the program. We already have uh, 17 graduates, which is pretty incredible, um, several of whom finished their fully accredited new associate's degrees, the first degree we've offered, uh, in six months or less. And since we bill in six month cycles, that means that those degrees um, cost $1,250. Half of those students are, are already on to bachelor's programs, and half have been promoted, in their, about half have been promoted in their work. So um, we're really working with employers, and it's all, and it's all online. Uh, we're working with employers um, uh, uh, to help them build talent pipelines, um, to really develop help them develop sort of promotable skills to address, again, the issue I, I raised about um, employers wanting to promote from within, but feeling that you know, people may not have those skills developed. Um, and then we're addressing issues around lowering turnover, succession planning, and, and, and really around em, 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 employee engagement. Um, and so th the areas covered in, co in College for America's program fall into three main parts. And it's really all the stuff that we keep hearing again and again from employers that workers lack. It's your basic foundational skills, communicate, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, digital liter uh, um, fluency and literacy. It's, it's teamwork and collaboration. It's everything you see up here. But what especially makes this relevant, we believe, is that, everything, it's th that the projects are all organized in the context of, of, of work. So, 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 for example, in our, our new healthcare degree, students um, you know, have projects where they might, for example, they're like an administrator of a hospital, and there's some epidemic that's hit their community, and they have to figure out how they're going to allocate resources. So they have to analyze data, you know, put together a spreadsheet, put together a written report, and deliver an oral report. And all of that, um, you know, when they hit send, um, is, is reviewed by our reviewers. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. The, 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 when we talk about competencies, what we really mean are, um, and the reason competencies are, uh, competencies are so key is, you know, earlier I was kind of pointing fingers like this, you know, the whole disconnect between employment and education, I believe, and came very strongly to believe, that a lot of this is just a cultural issue and a language issue and a, you know, businesses are, trying to run their business, and educators are trying to educate, and it's sort of like never the twain shall meet. And so part of the problem historically has been that um, we haven't had a way to kind of get everyone on the same page. And we believe that competencies are, you know, like one slide I've been showing people is a picture of, you know, remember those little magic decoder rings? Like of the magic decoder ring. Competencies become the magic decoder ring because competencies are, um, employers get competencies. Competencies are in job, in, embedded in job descriptions. Many companies use competencies in their own HR practices. Um, and we can use on the education side competencies to inform curriculum. And so when, we, when I talk about competencies, what we really mean are, are um, uh, um, can-do statements that, are, that are, are, are sort of 
clearly defined and measurable. So can negotiate with others to resolve conflicts and disputes, for example. And so, so the way CFA works is, is pretty interesting, too. So, so as I said, we're a business-to-business -business model. What we'll do is um, um, engage with companies that have large numbers of folks who are or workers who are, or who are <clears throat> um, in need of post-secondary credentialing really to advance or to help cut down on turnover. Um, um, we, 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 and then what, we'll, what we do is each student, um, we, we sort of try to figure out what is the problem we're looking to solve for that company. <clears throat> and then each student um, in the company is assigned a coach, a learning coach up at the top there. <clears throat> That's someone on our team. And the coach, their job is to help the student set pace to really figure out how are they going to fit this busy program, in, this program into their busy lives. Um, are they, are they, you know, when are they going to do homework? How, you know, is this something they're going to do in the mornings, at night, on the weekends, some combination of the above? You know, and given their own experience, um, there are sort of different uh, paths to taking on the various projects. Which projects do they want to take on first and why? So we're finding, for example, with many of our students, the really um, um, uh, fastest movers, these people have all sorts of conversations. They've learned it, you know, through the through the school of hard knocks. And so they know, like if they're strong writers, they may want to just like breeze through projects that involve writing, and they find that they can really quickly, you know, accumulate their competencies and kind of advance in the program. Um, the, we connect with whatever the employers have going on their end with regard to career development, <coughs> learning and development. Um, so for example, one of our big partners is Partners Healthcare in Massachusetts which is the largest employer in Massachusetts, and they have a whole program that's designed to help frontline workers um, prepare to take online courses. So they've had like 800 people go through this program, and, they, and the problem is the only like formal relationship they had prior to, um, prior to the relationship with College of America was with one community college to take one three credit course. So there's like this whole wealth of people who are like rearing to go, and now we become almost like the Program. So they have, they have advisors and people who've, who've worked with these folks, and we're just sort of tapping right into that, that feeder. Um, and, then, and, then, and then our students have mentors. Um, there's a, a big peer component. We, we like to bring in um, groups of folks in, in companies typically. You know, uh, we want 20, 25, or more. Um, and, and what we find is that there's real value in having that kind of peer cohort. Um, whether, but, but, but what's also really great, and I'm not showing it to you now, but if anyone's ever interested, we've developed this incredible learning management system um, where everything feeds in, all the communications of the students with their coaches and, the, um, and, and all the projects. And for each project, there's a very clear rubric and set of instructions so the student knows exactly what they've got to do and resources available and, and, um, and what they're being measured on. And then we have evaluators um, who, who, or reviewers, who, who um, when the student hits send, see that student's work and are measuring against the very same rubric that the student saw. Um, and, and then, and then, but what, what we're finding is that the community, um, and, and then and the last piece, by the way, an accountability partner, what we're also asking students to do is to find, some, to, to find someone to be sort of like their gym buddy in this process. So there's a woman who went through the program who was here in New Hampshire at Anthem Blue Cross who had her 11-year-old daughter as her um, accountability partner. And she said, you know, the, the kid was like, she held my feet to the fire. She kept saying, you know, Ma, you keep saying we have to go to school and you need this degree. So you, I have to do my homework, you have to do your homework. And she was like, it was like the greatest, you know, uh, driver to get her through it. But, the, but what we like to think of is with this whole network of support that even though it's online, that there really is sort of this kind of surround support. And with our learning management system, students can communicate and see one another, see one another um, through their little avatars online. They can also connect with other students in other parts of the program, other parts of the country or other companies who are working on similar projects. And so the whole idea here is, again, just to make this program that works for working adults. Um, you know, I mentioned that we, we assign an account manager, just the way it works with employers, we assign an account manager to work with that student, we figure out, with that company, we figure out how are we gonna 
even market this program within companies, um, where, you know, which typically involves some combination of direct outreach to students, but also engaging employers. Sometimes it starts in certain strategic parts of the organization. Um, and, you know, and then it's, 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 it's um, the companies are by and large covering the cost for college for America with tuition, uh, with their own tuition programs, which, you know, $2,500 a year. So many companies say to us, well, that's what we pay for, you know, someone to go to a weekend course. So it's like, it's, it's, and, you know, and then when we start running the ROI and thinking about what the bottom line impact is, it's, it's, it's a pretty high payoff. Um, and then the other piece that's really emerging is that it's really becoming like a sort of a cultural, um, it's helping to kind of support and even um, um, change, I think, in a very positive way, corporate culture. So uh, Lisa Gerton, who uh, presented Anthem, um, um, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, spoke just this past week in, 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 in DC with Paul LeBlanc at the um, ASTD conference, the American Society of Training and De Development conference. Um, and, and, and she talked about this like kind of impact on culture that, that you know, they, they targeted this initially to, in their company to frontline customer service folks, uh, but then a bunch of uh, managers started jumping on board um, and wanted to be involved. And they've been using it just to, you know, to, to kind of uh, recognize students as they accumulate competencies along the way. When they had their first six graduates, Lisa sent them all flowers, and you know, and, and apparently it just had this like she talked about it's had this kind of like effect throughout the company. Like people want to get involved, they're all excited, they they really feel that you know their their boss is giving back to them, which is really great. Um, one last point: we so we started with an associate's degree. Um, in it's a general associate's degree with a concentration in business. In um, just. A week and a half ago, we actually were approved by our creditor, NIAS, which stands for something, the Northeast, they credit the colleges in the Northeast, to, um, we were approved to start off um, for two bachelor's degrees, which is really great. So now we actually kind of have that pathway to, to advance people. Um, and, you know, we're just, needless to say, I'm, I keep telling people I feel like I'm playing in the best sandbox ever. <laughs> I mean, it's really kind of amazing. We just, the, um, the, the, the story of our BA, which if you add it up, is a $10,000 BA for the whole degree. I wish we'd known about that. Um, um, you know, is, is all over the news. It's been like a huge, huge story. Uh, we had um, um, just a couple days ago, I was telling Don, um, 80,000 unique visitors to our website who'd, who'd read somewhere or another or heard about this. So it's just, it's, it's like catching fire. So, you know, it's really interesting. It's not the end all be all. It's, it certainly is for a slice of the population. Um, it's, you know, it's a different modality. I mean, a, sort of a different tool in the toolbox. And I think what's really exciting to me from a workforce perspective is that it really is the first program that I've seen that truly marries both kind of upholding academic standards, but integrating them with workforce in a way that's, that's really unique. And, and so what, what we'll do, and I can get further into this, but what we do is, is when we design this program is we actually analyze the competencies in, in the kinds of jobs we're training for, and then we look at our curriculum and we see, well, how do those competencies align? And then our curriculum people working with subject matter experts from industry design these projects to like hit those competencies that are both relevant in work, but you know, make sure that they, that we're also meeting our academic standards. So it, you know, it's, it's sort of a no-brainer, but unfortunately it's just not what education has been built to do in the past. So I'll, I'll be quiet there, and let's have a conversation. The one thing I just wanted to quickly mention, uh, Julian mentioned <clears throat> NEASC, which is all schools and colleges need to have be accredited. If, if your degree is going to have, if you want to go from an undergraduate degree to a graduate degree, there, people want to know is there accreditation yeah. uh, involved. And uh, part of the significance of that is, I, I believe, we're the first such competency-based program approved by NEAS. I think the only one still. Uh, and, yeah. and also the federal government to, to receive Pell Grant eligibility. We're the only ones, we're the first. And we're the so first. this is really, this, you know, you hear the word groundbreaking, and this, this really is. There, there's, this is out of the box thinking that uh, nobody has caught up with uh, yet, but I suspect, um, will want to soon enough. Oh yeah, no, no, many, many want to. It's really interesting, I mean, one of the things um, I, th that's so cool about what we're doing is that Paul has really created a, a space 
Um, you know, College of America grew out of really this idea of creating an innovation lab, and this was the first project of the innovation lab here at SNU. And, and it's really, you know, it's kind of a unique um, environment for us that, you know, most colleges and universities just are not set up to do. And then we have the benefit of our online program, which is this, you know, incredibly successful um, um, venture that's able to help support the development of this. So you know, we're in a really unique position, I think, and, and you know, have a real chance to leave a major mark. Yeah, so, so one is, in, is, is, a, is, a, is a business degree, and the other is communication. Like, is this administration degree? It, it's business management. There are, there are liberal, yeah, there, it's, not a, it's a BA. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly. It's, and it's really, um, you know, both that degree and the communications as well, they're really, um, you know, we've been looking at the various competencies, as I said, and they're really hitting a lot of the skills that companies say they need in their management. Um, yeah. My is, um, who are the CFA reviewers? Good question, yeah. So the reviewers are, um, they're faculty, they're subject matter experts. The reviewers are really the closest we have to sort of, you know, faculty. And it, although, it, although we don't really have a sort of a typical professor role in the traditional sense because no one's delivering lectures, the coaches are uh, sort of a combination of career life planner, um, and college ad, uh, advisors, um, and then and then the reviewers are really more the faculty. Yeah, did you have a question or comment? From the employer standpoint, what is their participation? Is it also uh, financial requirement? I mean, what how's, you say you have many partners? Yeah, yeah. Well, the employers, as I said, the employers by and large are paying for the tuition. Yeah. Um, and it varies. I mean, you know, there are some employers that are saying, okay, it's 2,500 bucks a year, we'll cover 2,000, we want employees to put in 500 or something. You know, it's, some are saying they're covering the, you know, for many employers, they have far larger tuition, you know, their tuition programs might cover up to $5,000 worth. So the employers basically are covering the tuition. Beyond that, you know, there's not a whole heavy lift for the employers. I mean, the, I will say that, you know, part of the reason we have to keep the costs where they are is um, versus, say, the, the rest of this college or most colleges is the employers really are our admissions, in a sense, department. They're helping us kind of vet and find the students. So, so they are playing that role, um, but it's not alien to them. It's something that they sort of are doing. Sticking with the employer. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, it really it really varies. You know, I mean, it, we have smaller, we have some smaller companies, we have some huge companies, we have companies with 200 people, 500 people, we have companies with hundreds of thousands. You know, we're working with McDonald's. Um, so, yeah, pretty wide range. So, there's a lot of massive number of students that have to come from a company that we should have a critical mass for a project. Well, you know, as I said, we're really trying to, you know, we really want it to be 25 or more. Um, it, if there's the potential to go to scale or, uh, uh, you know, if, if there's a potential to, you know, the real strategy has been largely around running pilots um, and then going to what we call open enrollment where, so, so McDonald's is in a pilot right now with us, Panera is in a pilot with us, um, where they have, I can't even remember the exact numbers, 40, 50 students, um, but, the, but um, in six months the plan is to just open it up broadly, so, yeah. So on that same thought, well, you know, we'd like them to have um, 25 students. You know, we're working with some smaller companies that have smaller numbers. Um, I'm also really interested in, because in, I know you're, you all represent a mix of smaller you know, different size companies. Um, you know, I, we also are definitely interested and open to creative ways of figuring out how to aggregate, you know, smaller groups. I mean, I think we could work through business, through associations is really the obvious one, <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, um, but even like, so one of the things that happened the other day with, or th that is happening as we speak, with this huge, you know, press coverage that we've had about the $10,000 BA, well, we're getting a lot of companies interested. We're also getting thousands and thousands of individuals who want to come to the program. And so one of the things we're looking at now is we can actually bring in cohorts of folks from different companies, um, but we sort of need you know, probably 50 at a time. So, that, so you know, so like we could conceivably work with a bunch of smaller companies. We would just, we might not be able to say we can do it. You know, McDonald's, they come in, 
we're, we'll set it up next week. <laughs> you know, smaller companies, we might need to get a few of them before we can actually begin the cohort. How many students are you actually working with now? Right now, it's about 500. It's about, it's about 500. 500? Yeah. Yeah, but that's just since October, and it's, it is poised to take off. I mean, we have about, well, as of last week, we had about 200 companies in the pipeline that we were sort of at various stages of discussion, but that number's probably going to go to, you know, 2,000. How long does it take to bring the company from when you discussions about doing this to when you actually start being able to enroll students and get them through a process? You know, it's really as long as it takes the company um, to, to, to do business with us. It, it, we need to be able, I think by the 20th, we need to like know, have the students like, know who the students are and have something set up by the 20th of a month to be able to begin the next month. Now that said, you know, some of these companies we're dealing with are big with lots of layers and bureaucracy. Sometimes it's taking six months. I, I don't know what the average is. It's a good question. I think the average is probably about three, four months, but that's mostly because we have some behemoths. And some of like the big healthcare systems there they're slow to make decisions. So we have a whole bunch, so, you know, we've seeded so many, and my guess is that, and what's happening now is they're kind of popping left and right, but smaller ones are obviously much quicker. So with all this um, attention now, what's it going to look like behind the scenes once the tipping point actually hits? <laughs> um, good, it's a very good question. Yeah, it's a good question. Mean, it is a good, interesting way to put it. Well, so it's funny, because just yesterday, we, we actually have a, a consultant who just did a, a study for us that looked at kind of trigger points where we're going to have to scale big time. I mean, right now, when I started in um, March of last year, I was employee number seven, and I think we're now up to 47, something like that. Um, so we, our capacity now, you know, we, we know how many coaches and reviewers we need, um, and right now, so, so, so I think once we start getting over um, 3,000 is a bump up, you know, Five, six thousand is another big bump up, but you know, I mean, we're the, the model is really eminently scalable. What we we built from the beginning, we really have built this for scale and speed. <laughs> um, it's in many ways, College for America is a big data project. Everyone who comes into the program, we're collecting. It's a little bit um, big brotherish in some ways. We're collecting data on everything they do. We have all their coach conversations documented, whether it's on the phone or texting or chatting or, or whatever, email. Um, we know exactly which projects they're doing and when, and which they've mastered and not yet. We know the demographics. We know which companies are doing it. And most of our students are signing because they get, um, um, well, because we're an educational institution, they have to, they, um, there's, privacy laws, but most of our students are signing a waiver. Many other companies are actually saying, you want to do this, we'd ask you to sign this waiver so the companies can actually see individual student data as well as aggregate data. But we're, we're really able to monitor and track all of this. In the back? Just a quick question. When you go into a company, you know, you have X amount of students at the company, do you do most of your work at the company, you know, setting up and deciding the projects and I guess I'm trying to understand yeah. how it works. Well, no, no, we really don't. I mean, so, so we're not, we could, but we've chosen not to do kind of customized training. Our projects are not customized to a given company. No, I, I didn't mean that, but for instance, give me an example of some students that you have right now at a company. Sure. I, are you wondering how they're onboarded? Well, program. I'm just wondering how you start the process. Is it oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So I'll explain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. That's a good question. I understand you. Um, so what we do is a couple of things. So number one, so company, some company says they want to work with us. We agree to work with them. We assign an account manager. The account manager comes to the company. We figure out, you know, who are going to be the students. How are we going to recruit them? If we need to, we bring in our marketing team, which is really good um, to, to kind of, because we have all sorts of collateral and materials and, you know, different companies where there are different ways of getting the word out. Um, but then once we have, then, then we'll do um, informational sessions. If we can do them face to face, we will, depending on where the company is and where our, our, um, you know, our, our partnership development people are. Um, but we also do a lot of like on webinar info sessions. Um, typically, the info sessions will reach a broader group than we'll, may actually end up in the course. So maybe we'll have 40, 50 people come to an info session, 30 of whom end up in the program. Um, and, then, and then being in the program is really simple. It's like a simple, all, all they really need is like their name and email. 
<laughs> and they're in. And, they, and once they log in for the first time, um, they, they immediately hear from their coach. And the coach, they can't proceed um, without having the coach conversation. The other thing is at the very beginning, they have to complete a sort of an intake questionnaire. Um, we're not doing, the requirement for entry is high school diploma or GED. We're not doing any testing up front, which is, yeah, which is, which is really kind of interesting. Um, you know, a lot of the colleges, a lot, most colleges do testing, and you know, especially at the associate's level, the community colleges put a lot of energy into tests like AccuPlays for these different tests. And the truth is, it's a huge effort, and, and we're finding that companies have a pretty good feel for you know, who the program would be appropriate for. Um, and, and that, but, but with the questionnaire, the questionnaire is really designed in some ways. It includes some writing. It, it's a, it really helps us figure out who's going to, we, we can now begin to tell with some certainty who's going to be able to get through this program just based on how they respond to the questionnaire. Um, and so then they have a conversation with a coach who helps them just sort of figure out how they're going to tackle this, and they're off to the races. And then we're finding that most of the coaching happens in the first couple of weeks for most students, but the coaches are always there and can follow on. And then we have, we have like a reading center, which basically means there's some a reading lab or something. Um, there are people like online at a certain time, or writing, you know, like basically to do like kind of extra support. They're like subject matter experts that we have online and available to work with um, students. Um, so technically, most of this is done online. It's all online. Okay. It's all online. You don't go into the company and, and work with the people at the company and have, I mean, you have, so everything is done online. Yeah, it is. I, you know, I mean, there are companies that we'll go to physically if they're not far from us, just just to have a presence and you know, and, and, and be, you know, be a good, be a friendly partner. But no, really, it's all it's all online. Yeah. Please, and then you'll Resources are available for the student to help them become that subject matter expert prior to taking the competency test. Is it online text, videos? Yeah. So, so the so the resources available. So, 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 the, so our academic um, team for each project, they, what they're really doing is curating materials that are online. Um, so they pull together all sorts of resources, writing, videos, you know, you name it. Um, and some of some some of which reside out there online, and others some some we've developed ourselves on our own servers. Um, and so, and, and that's, that's really it. And so the students are, um, so the students review all these resources when they undertake a project. Um, and, and then, you know, once they've submitted the project, if they, if they haven't yet mastered a project, the reviewer, we promise, will get back to them within 48 hours, although I think we've been averaging about 32 hours, um, with a report that says, you know, you, on this project, you mastered this competency and, not, and that competency, but not this one, not yet this one. And here are some resources, additional resources you might consider as you undertake that project. So it's all, it's all free, it's all, but, but that's a big, big lift. And that's another um, you know, real academic role that, the, that folks are pretty carefully you know, curating those resources. Well, we actually, we actually think it's a very rigorous and enriched educational process. It's a different process. I mean, it's, 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 it's um, I mean, the, 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 all the degrees are drawn from actual SNU degrees. So like the first degree was, you know, SNU associates that, from which we extracted or identified these 120 competencies. Um, so everything they're doing is up to the same level of academic rigor. And, um, and we would say that whereas, you know, in a, in a, um, I don't know, like, so, you know, like, so, uh, you know, maybe, um, maybe this, maybe this week, you know, I know Don had a tough week, so I'm going to, like, you know, up his grade by half a tick, because, you know, I know he was, he's having a hard time with, you know, that crazy job he has. In our program, the reviewers don't know nothing about Don. It's, it's, it's all blind. So when, when, when you hit send as a student, it goes to reviewer, and all the reviewer is looking at is the, is the matrix against which they're supposed to review you. And we even have um, um, double-blind reviews, not, not with every one, but we'll have uh, a couple of reviewers look at, a, at projects, you know, we'll just sort of pull them and look at them. Um, and, you know, so it's really, it's, it's in, in many ways, we say when our 
people graduate, no one's getting a C or a B plus. Everyone's mastered each competency, and they don't pass until they master. You know, it's, a, it's actually, if I may just quickly insert it, it's a very, very interesting question, because it's a, it, it strikes to culture and assumptions. Yeah. And uh, I remember, uh, it was right around 2000, uh, when I was working in another college, there's a, every industry has its own news format or, or rag, and our, our, <laughs> in the higher ed, it's the Chronicle of Higher Education. And I, somehow, it just, I, I wish I'd saved this uh, particular magazine, because I, I remember very well the cover, it was this, uh, you couldn't have found a better uh, subject matter for the cover, it was this, this, uh, this senior faculty member with the white beard and the, and the glasses and the tweed jacket, Pose like this, and the caption was something along the lines of "Online education, not ever." <laughs> and it was his line, and he was from this prominent school. I want to say Ivy League, but I'm not sure. And it was about how just it, it's just something that absolutely cannot work. <laughs> you, every institution out there, including his, I'm sure, is providing online education. So, because it's become such a sophisticated format. And I think what we're really talking about, yes, we are, it's cheapening it in that it's, it's providing access to people that otherwise wouldn't have access, for which we're very proud. Um, it's, it's also, however, it's when you really get to the guts of it, correct me if I'm wrong, but much of it is about delivery of content. So uh, I was talking with Mike earlier about banking and how much of it is moving to using this. Right? A lot of it. But you're still getting your check cleared. It's not, you know, 99 cents to a dollar. It's a dollar to a dollar. So, and, and it's what people want to do. Uh, so it's, it's an efficient means of delivery. It is. And, you know, and I think it's, it's as I say, it, it, it really is one tool in the toolbox. I mean, I think if we look ahead, if we look way ahead to, you know, three years, five years, ten years, um, I think we're going to see a spectrum. Um, I don't think traditional campuses are going to go away. I think some of them might, especially if they're charging too much money and not their students aren't satisfied with the results. But I think we're going to see kind of a whole blend and mix. So, so we're actually doing some really interesting experimentation um, with organizations that are serving on or underemployed, working with schools, looking at ways we can partner with other you know, community colleges, other, other higher ed institutions. Because certainly, if not the whole program, even pieces of it might be relevant, or with some populations, our program combined with a lot of extra supports. You know, yesterday, for example, I was speaking to all the directors of Youth Build USA, which is a pretty big nonprofit that you know is really working with at risk, uh, at risk or, or opportunity youth, depending on which euphemism you prefer. Um, kids who really had a, dropped out kind of at the end of their tether with school, um, and you know we think that our program and are, are demonstrating that our program can work for young people like that, but it, it's, it requires, they require a lot more social wraparound support services than say our typical employee partner at, at Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield. Yeah. <clears throat> these, uh, these sessions are you know, quite interesting, but um, uh, it was really interesting to me, you know, the impact that Clay Christensen had on Paul when he invited him to yeah. you know, speak with us before, because this is a disruptive process. And uh, it was about, what, three or four years ago. And, um, you know, and he had to talk about the disruptive process in healthcare, and he was just you know, moving on into education. And, you know, it, it's good to see, you know, Paul not only listen and say, well, how the heck can I, you know, implement oh, yeah. this? And uh, one of the things that, uh, that you're going to have an issue with even here today is really emphasize, and this is a B2B, uh, you know, model, you know, business to business model. And um, you have to distinguish yourself, you know, from the traditional way people think, going back to the disruptive, yeah. you know, process. The other thing that, uh, as you know, we had a presentation on this, or our, one of the organizations I'm involved with uh, uh, this week. And uh, the questions and concerns had to do with online education, right? Uh, uh, the, uh, computer competency, for instance, as a prerequisite. Yeah. The distinguishing fact feature that I see here is that um, the online part is a resource 
not a teaching vehicle. You know, it's a resource of this new model, you know, of developing competencies and to be able to distinguish that in your offering. This is not another online no, new no, it's true. So it's, it's a slippery slope, you know, when you're presenting it as online. Right. Because, you know, the vehicle, you know, of the resources are online. But the, the, the special thing of the coach, you know, oh, and the yeah. understanding of the individual you know, that may be more verbal versus written, you know, in their communication yeah. to, to be able to display their competency was how it was presented to us. Yeah, no, no, it's a really, it's a really, really good point, and, and, and definitely, you know, what we're trying to do is borrow from the best of what we see going on with online, but also the best of what we know about, you know, adult education and, and, and using technology and learning. The other piece that is interesting, because some people do immediately when they, you know, hear this sort of innovation, think online, uh, for-profit ripoff. <laughs> and the other point that's really important that I emphasize, and I didn't with you because you all know, is that we're a non that we're a nonprofit, and that that helps a lot too, um, because we're not you know while we're Pell eligible, we're not out there to take students Pell, and we're not going to do that unless we're really clear that a student is suitable for the program, and there are no other and there's no employer or no other funding source to help pay for them. relative to the uh, uh, transferability of credits yep. and how you can assess credits. And I know that you thought that whole process through too. So for the employer, you know, to also understand that, you know, if a student, an employee starts to matriculate through the process halfway through it and decided I'm gonna pursue education another way, that they do have transferable practice. Yeah, they do. Well, they get a transcript that, as I said, is a traditional, they get a SNU diploma, traditional transcript. We have to, our, our accreditors of the federal government for the Pell eligibility have required that we can map everything we're doing at the competencies to traditional courses. Um, and for employers, you know, I've had a couple of employers. I was just talking to a head of um, senior VP for training and development, a big multinational. Um, and he, you know, he, was, he said, look, we're really interested in this, but you know, it's going to be a little bit of a sell here in this company. We have a lot of like very, you know, a lot of people are sort of very elite in their thinking, and, and they're like, well, you know, what, what is this newfangled thing? And, and what we find is that um, when we open our, our um, computers and, you know, maybe sign an NDA first, but we'll show the employers the very competencies we're teaching and kind of they can see under the hood a little bit, it's like they're blown away because they see this is exactly what we're looking for, you know, in our, in our employees and our, and our managers in particular. So, we oh, yeah, have Actually, continuing on with that, I work with a lot of high tech companies. Yeah. People are already well educated and so on, but people are building out their own learning management systems. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, they're finding those competencies. And I can tell you personally, being someone who's delivered a certain training and competency model, you know, skill for them. They do a very bad job of all the things you're talking about. Yeah. You know, assigning the coach, assigning the mentor, mm -hmm. the accountability. And I think what's lost on them is the, you know, the peer interaction and so on. Mm -hmm. So as you move forward, I don't know if you're looking at, you know, south of the border, especially around you know, the Burlington area where there are a lot of high tech companies. Mm -hmm. How are you going to approach those kind of companies? See, I don't think they have an issue now with, you know, the, the elite. Piece of it versus we already have an LMS system. We already have, have you know the learning and development VP. We're actually creating our own program. We have a staff of you know a hundred creating yeah. curriculum. How do you deal with that? Is that, or is that something you need to look at? No, no, no. It's a bit, it's a really good question. I, I actually um, met recently with um, Elliot Macy, who's kind of like you know one of the gurus of training and development, talking about this very topic and. Um, and you know, it's it's interesting. I, I, I guess I kind of feel like, you know, going back to the whole notion of disruptive innovation, we're still at an early stage, and we're at a stage where really the companies that are joining us are early adopters. And so, um, and those early adopters, number one, they are looking, they recognize the value of what we're doing, and they're trying to think about how do we make this fit with our own TMD, our own training and development strategy. Um, the ones that to me say, oh, well, we're already doing it. I'm like, well, you know, here's my card. If at some point you want to talk, <laughs> let's have that conversation. My feeling is I don't want to fight that battle now just because I do agree with you. I mean, I think, unfortunately, I think most companies 
are not doing it that well. Their LMSs are, eh, are um, their, their companies and colleges too. This whole movement to competency, a lot of what they're doing is very superficial. I mean, we're using, um, in our analysis of competencies in our curriculum, we're using like, you know, whatever, I don't want to throw out a peat and overused word, but you know, like state of the art, um, 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 natural language processing, like artificial intelligence to analyze, you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs and to, and to be able to parse from those the very language that we can then use and then we put that in front of employers and say, look, is this real? Most of them are not even coming close to doing that. But the other piece that's interesting is our LMS has won some pretty high acclaim. Um, Brian Peddle, who's our chief technology officer, recently, um, it's built on the Salesforce platform and just this past year he was uh, um, asked to come to Dreamforce, which is like the big, you probably know, the big Salesforce conference in California. It was like, and, and Brian, um, Mar Mar um, Marissa Mayer was uh, the keynote speaker, and Brian was asked to come up onto the stage just before she gave her keynote address, and he was interviewed for five minutes in front of like, you know, 25,000 people at the Moscone Center, and another 100,000 watching on screens around San Francisco, because they were blown away by what we're doing, and the truth is, for us, it's costing like, uh, $15, I think, $15 or $20 a student to administer the program, which is just mind-boggling. So, so, so our LMS now, actually, we're in the process of figuring out ways that we can actually turn the replication and use of the LMS into a business. So your LMS is based on Salesforce.com? It's based on Salesforce. So for me, hearing that, when you go into a corporation, 90% of the corporations are adopted Salesforce or Salesforce. Exactly. So to be able to say, you know, I, I think the bigger issue is yeah. the upfront work, aligning the competencies yep. and then finding them down. Exactly. Which ones they want to focus on. And to me, the rest of it is the easier part. It is. It is, and, and that's why I think you know that's that's why um, I, you know, that's why you know when I met Paul and Chris. Um, you know, and we were like, well, here's what you they're trying to accomplish, and here's what I do. It was like, okay, we're coming together. Because, you know, like how many how many colleges have a you know workforce strategy center? You know, it's pretty it's kind of a, a unique undertaking because that's it. I mean the, what we do is our upfront work kind of permeates the whole organization from our partnership development to our marketing to our curriculum to our to the coaching and how we advise students I and mean, then how we evaluate them because the competencies just have to be threaded through everything. Yeah, when you mentioned um the internal workings of, of companies that do this kind of training. Uh, it, it's clearly mission critical to the organization. Yeah. What will be very interesting to, to watch is if it becomes analogous to payroll, which is also mission critical to an organization, but is outsourced because it's not yeah. their prime knitting. No, it's true. But we would, I, I should also say, we would like, I mean, I'd love to talk further about this and would, you know, your, you know, little, give me a little glimpse of some words of wisdom there, but would love to hear more and even if there are ways we can connect on this because yeah. we need all the help we can get to unlock those, you know, because it's, what we find is that it's really interesting too with some corporations, yeah, we're talking to the learning and development people, but in some ways the biggest, like, immediate hit we get are from people on the operational side. And it's usually kind of more visionary types who are just like all over this. But you could also be a threat. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, I, and that, so the question, no, well exactly, no, no, that's, a, no, it's a really good point. And I think hearing more about that and figuring out. training, training people. Right. That's their job. That's so interesting. That's a really
because they, they can articulate that about themselves and they can look at that with organizations and, and see that that is a better match. It's not that kind of miss. That yeah, no, no, it's a, it's a really good point. And one of the things we're working on that's also really exciting, it's falling under my shop, um, is, is so, so one of the things I've I mentioned these analytics that we're using. We've been working with the state of Texas is sort of seen among states as kind of a leader in labor market analysis and it's really head of, head of class. And we're actually partnering um, with them on essentially putting in place this engine um, that does analysis of jobs and natural language processing and of, of resumes and curriculum and all this sort of stuff. Um, and then allows us to, to have this like really good data to inform job hunting, curriculum development. But um, what we're looking at, we're doing it at CFA now, but um, you know, we're looking at how we can uh, really inform university college and, and the online college as well. Because everyone needs this data. We, and, and having the competency, most, um, without getting too technical, most like job hunting programs, it's all about keywords. So like, you know, do I know whatever, PowerPoint. Well, you know, if PowerPoint becomes obsolete tomorrow, then where does that leave you with your resume? When you look at competencies, these are the skills you have that have a much longer shelf life. These are, that have the longest shelf life. And so that's why we're, you know, so we're, what we're putting in place is sort of a competency-centric uh, tools for, for doing this, yeah. I'm coming from an employer standpoint. I understand you need to market to large companies because that's where the masses are. Um, but there's, I employ 85 uh, people, uh, 85, and there was some that I think was exciting. I don't know if I, if I offered it, if I would have two or 10 or 20 or 40. Yeah, really? and, um, from an employer's standpoint, uh, 40 at once would be a financial uh, burden, perhaps. Right, that's understandable. Uh, but if I think statistically small businesses employ the majority of the uh, people. Absolutely. Time. So I know you touched on it earlier that maybe you could prove Oh, we definitely could. I, that would be really exciting. Oh, no. We, we could group people, and we could also, we could also talk to you, but we have several small companies that we're working with. You know, it's, it's, we absolutely are, you know, it's just that if we're going to, like, divide, it's more about how do we spend our time in outreach and marketing. But, I mean, we, every small company that's come to us has, you know, we've given them a fair hearing, and we're happy to work with them. But I do think that this idea of beginning to think of ways of grouping and working with associations and we're even just managing ourselves. It's like, look, we want to work with you in maybe a month or two because we're still trying to line up another four or five companies in the area, which, you know. I mean, it's a great benefit for the It is. It's It is. It's one that's going to have Right. Yeah. yeah, it does. It does. It does. And, and the whole idea. I mean, really, what companies are by and large doing with us is they're going and they're tapping employees on the shoulder and saying, "Look, you know, we really see great. You know, we really like you. We see great potential for you. And here's this opportunity. We'd love if you're into it. We'd love to make this available. That I'm telling you, that is like worth gold. Yeah, I'm thinking like five when I go back. Good. Hey, you know, really yeah, good. Well, we should definitely talk. <laughs> I'd be happy to connect you with our partnership to all the people. Please. Would this be applicable to high school students? Um, maybe, say, technical school, where it's sort of a non-traditional program unto itself. They're not your typical student coming into a college environment. For many of them, um, you know, college might be something they don't think they can really achieve or do. They're more specific to whatever skill. So is there some application to high schools? And if so, yeah. how could that be rolled out? Oh, yeah, there definitely is. And we're already working with a couple of high schools. We actually have a proposal in that Paul's been championing. Um, the federal government, so they approved us um, for you know, federal financial aid. And now they have this like um, RFP or something out that they call the Exocytes Project, where they want to basically, they did just us, and then all these other places came forward. So now they're like trying to do group, groups of them around these various um, experimental projects. We actually have a project to work with the New Hampshire high schools in 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 process. That'd be great, and it's tr you know really trying to figure out those articulations. We um, just the other night I was talking to a group in Boston about a collaboration we have with um, um, Match Education, which is a charter school in Boston area, and we're working with them and it's showing great results. They've targeted alums 
of their program. So it's like kids who've graduated this program, but they're providing that like extra layer of social support that you know that our 2,500 bucks alone won't cover. But matched with us, no no pun intended, um, it's really like showing we already have students enrolled in there like buzzing along. You know, again, I think for the right students, it's great. You know, like my, you know, I have. Um, 13 year old twins and 11 year old. My, my 13 year old son, if he had the opportunity to do this as opposed to like being on a campus, in like five seconds he would do it. I mean, I think with him is I probably have to push him onto a campus so he, to pull him away from his computer. Um, but you know, I think for some people it's, it's a good option, and especially for those who are like vocationally oriented. Yeah. And just as a follow up to that, what are the, any credits that the high school students could earn? Yeah, let's say, you know, while they're in school, yeah. be transferable to other um, educational uh, places other than, let's say, students? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the way they're structuring it is as like a two plus two type program where the last couple of years of high school are blended with the first couple of years of college. So they're getting the college credit. They'll get that transcript that they can carry forward with us or somewhere else. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, I guess we're, we're actually, Chris, did you? You gotta be careful, it's like an auction. It's like so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come on, come on, bring it on. So, there's a couple of things. What Nick is saying, I'm on the uh, Board of Trustees of the Technical College, oh, okay. and, and we, we're teaching people specific skills on how to make things. We have an articulation agreement with SNU for a bachelor's program, but some of those students really, you know, they're, not, they're already not geared for what I would call traditional higher ed. So uh, we have a board meeting tomorrow. I'm bringing up tomorrow with something to discuss uh, because of our existing relationship. But the other thing I wanted to say is that you know, as an alumni of this institution and having worked with companies that try to do what you're doing for their own employees, I'm really, really proud to be associated you know, with this institution and with what you're doing. It's really great. That's really nice of you to say. And we are, I will say, with a technical connection, which is interesting and worth, you know, exploring perhaps is, um, like, I believe that there's a huge opportunity for us to partner with other higher ed institutions, because, again, it's hard to, you know, like, we, the, you know, we have, like, this team working on this that's just, like, you know, most, most of the colleges, I mean, I've worked with pretty much every community college in the country, they, they're just not set up to do this. It's, like, such a leap. In some ways, it's almost hard for them to get out of their own way to do this, just because it's not what they do. It's not what they sign on for. Um, and so, so we are actually uh, have a project now working uh, with National Community College uh, on, a, and on, and on a manufacturing, an advanced manufacturing program, where essentially we're going to do what we do, and we're going to do it side by side and integrate it in one program, that requires some hands-on and technical pieces that we don't cover. So it's just a way to kind of like bring some of the costs way, way down. And they're, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a benefit to their students. So, you know, I think we could probably be looking at a lot more of that, because I just don't think other colleges are going to be able to do what we're doing. We're really lucky. Well, thanks so much for, for your, your coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, two real quick points uh, as, as we look forward uh, to some things that we're working at here. So first of all, just put, putting on your calendars way in advance, uh, the homecoming weekend uh, is uh, going to be the October 18th and 20th of, of this year. Uh, Chris did a bang up job reinventing it last year. And uh, uh, those of you who had come uh, to it, I think you would have agreed it was a great time. And for those of you who didn't, you missed something great. You don't want to miss something twice in a row. Uh, the other uh, thing that I will uh, mention um, is we're, we're about a, a year into this, but really uh, catching a lot of steam where career services and alumni relations are working very, very uncommonly as far as colleges are concerned, tightly together uh, to leverage the alumni as a resource to help our students, networking, jobs, et cetera. So, um, you know, any uh, and all support, many of you are already uh, involved in a number of these initiatives, but uh, I'll just throw that out there. You, uh, uh, we, we don't always just call only for money. Sometimes we call often these days for, for jobs and direct support for our, our students as well. Uh, it's just uh, the entire community weighing on each other to, uh, to make it uh, better and stronger. So uh, that's, that's what's, uh, th those are the things that we're building on. Uh, 
feel free to, to uh, we have more muffins and what have you. Uh, they're all paid for, so please take them. <laughs> uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, network, enjoy each other's company, and thank you for coming. <laughs>